Well, hello, and I'd like to pick up from previous videos and previous lectures and say a few things about a few topics that are related to series, parallel circuits, electric circuits with resistors, etc. I'd like to discuss the two topics today of real batteries and grounding circuits. Now, real batteries are batteries that have real resistance. They're, in some sense, more realistic batteries, so to say. And then I'd also like to discuss uh, what it takes to get a circuit grounded. In other words, to give it its sort of zero voltage point and have a reference point. So let's first summarize what we've seen before. Series uh, resistors and parallel resistors. Remember, series resistors, the idea is that uh, the overall resistance ends up becoming greater than each individual resistor. The overall resistance is equal to the sum of each resistance from the resistors in series. The voltage is what gets divided amongst the resistors, but the current is the same in all resistors. Whereas with parallel circuits, the overall resistance is less than any individual resistor because of this reciprocal rule. The equivalent resistance, it's reciprocal, is equal to the sum of the reciprocals of each resistance. So to get this equivalent resistance, you have to take the reciprocal at the end. And what that means is, again, you have um, the total or the equivalent resistance is smaller than the smallest one. Parallel resistors each have the same voltage across each resistor, or at least each branch, so to say. And then parallel resistors divide up the current, though. Okay, so hopefully that's a helpful summary. Now for circuits that contain both series and parallel resistors, the same rules apply. I recommend you simplify the resistors down into a single equivalent resistor. So consider the following circuit below. You probably should start furthest away from the battery and you should think about geometrically what should be added first. I think if you look at this circuit, R2 and R3 are next to each other and those should be added in parallel before this assembly is in series with R1. So add R2 and 3 using the reciprocal rule first and then take that resulting uh, reciprocal sum and then add it with traditional arithmetic adding to resistor 1. Okay, so this example I'm going to recommend we do this in a later video. Okay, so I will show the solution for this um, uh, circuit. Okay, but now let's discuss ideal versus real batteries. This is one of the crux ideas of today's lecture. So ideal batteries maintain a constant voltage, that is a constant EMF in a circuit, and nearly unlimited current is possible. Real batteries, however, do have internal resistance that limits the amount of current they can provide. Okay. So in fact, if you've seen my simulations before where I built the intuition about circuits, and in particular parallel circuits, where a lot of current is running, I showed that the little simulation shows a fire. Well, in general, a real battery would have a little bit of resistance, so perhaps maybe more current could actually be provided. The characteristics of real batteries is that batteries are rated via their EMF. Now, EMF is an archaic term. It's an 1800s term. It technically means electromotive force, but I don't want to even use those words out loud again because an EMF is a voltage, which we now know is an energy per charge. So I don't want to imply the F word here. So, but we retain the term, EM, the term EMF for the maximum rating or sort of the ideal part of a real battery. So real batteries possess an internal resistance, which is often uh, denoted as lowercase r. Now, remember, this is just a small amount of resistance of the battery. Don't get confused. This is not a radius. It's definitely in units of ohms. And again, the voltage of the battery when no current is flowing is the EMF. Okay, So that's going to be capital epsilon. And then again, I don't even want to mention out loud this F word because... EMF is what I'll just say from now on. I don't want you to think about it like a force, okay? It's a voltage. It's a energy per charge, okay? 
Now the terminal voltage though is the actual voltage output of a real battery. In other words, where it really comes off the negative terminal. And when I say really comes off the negative terminal, we know that real batteries in reality actually have electrons that are generally flowing. Um, even though mathematically we often do things as if uh, current came off the positive terminal of batteries. The larger the current, the smaller the terminal voltage. Okay, that's because if more current goes to the battery, if the, if the battery has internal resistance, that current is slowed all the more by the battery's internal resistance. And as batteries age, chemical potential energy decreases, so the battery resistance increases, and terminal voltage decreases as batteries age. So a couple things to say about real batteries is, number one, you may think that a battery is sort of easy or simple or ubiquitous, and they are in our modern world, but batteries were an amazing invention in the middle of the 19th century, that is the 1800s. Remember I mentioned before that Volts is named after Alessandro Volta, the Italian scientist who really created a battery for us. Before Volta, basically people were just using capacitors which could store charge, but gonna, they would not have a constant voltage delivered. And so electrical experiments, especially things for DC, direct current, were very difficult to do. Once batteries were invented, a lot of electrical experiments and a lot of applications were used for batteries. Now, by the way, one thing I haven't mentioned before is that even though we assume conventional current goes from negative to positive and the conventional current goes round the circuit, a battery has a positive and a negative terminal such that the electric field is from positive to negative the electric field is actually the opposite direction inside the battery. So the whole reason a battery works is that it's constantly um, using um, an anode and cathode, and it has battery acid in there. Um, it, I mean, there's various batteries like nickel cadmium. Um, there's lead oxide batteries. But the idea is that a chemical reaction is constantly taking charges and boosting them sort of against their will, against the direction that they should go in terms of they usually should be going down potential from positive to negative but the battery as it's being used has that chemical reaction that continues to produce that nearly constant voltage but I'm no expert on batteries that's a few thoughts about batteries um, you can look up a lot of um, interesting things about batteries one thing I'll also say is that over time, that chemical reaction slows down, and that chemical reaction builds up corrosion and builds up blockages for those um, ions to be created. And as a result, um, the internal resistance of the battery increases until the battery is not so useful anymore, and usually we just discard those batteries. Uh, keep in mind, there are rechargeable batteries out there. Okay, Reduce some of the ion buildup that has gone in the opposite direction that we want the potential to go with respect to a battery if we make a rechargeable battery. But even rechargeable batteries over time eventually uh, no longer build up the voltage that we really want them to. And one last thing I'll say about batteries is that batteries are a very important technology. Most batteries have not really much improved their technology, at least not in terms of any sort of real breakthrough in terms of battery technologies, for decades. So this video is being recorded in the year 2020. So for decades, most batteries have remained relatively constant in terms of their technology. But for reasons like renewable energy, because solar and wind and other kinds of renewable energy is not always available or not always made at times that the users want it. Battery technology is an important technology moving in towards the future. So if you are interested in uh, battery technologies, I would definitely recommend seek that field because I think there's a lot of room for improvement. All right, enough about my soapbox. Let us move on to um, some other things about batteries. Now, what about some batteries that are in series? So what I have here is a depiction of a flashlight shown as sort of like an x-ray type image. Notice that 
we have two batteries stacked in um, end to end. Notice that we have positive terminal, negative terminal, then the next positive terminal, negative terminal. Notice that batteries in series are basically going to give us the sum of their voltages, that is their terminal voltages. So if you put two D cell batteries, each of which are 1.5 volts, that's the standard, then the overall voltage should be 3 volts. And that goes from the spring, which is usually the negative terminal of the battery placement in the flashlight, up here to the positive terminal. So that way you can light the flashlight bulb. Okay. Now flashlight batteries are placed in series to create twice the potential difference in one battery. So here's a 3 volt um, uh, needed load and sometimes it's called the voltage load for this light bulb in this particular flashlight. So how do we model a real battery? So imagine we have a circuit diagram here and then what's outlined here in yellow and dashed line is meant to represent a real battery. Notice here is the EMF which is the maximum sort of rating of the battery but because the battery probably has some real internal resistance, let's say it's an older battery, then you can imagine that uh, the terminal voltage between sort of A and B here, let's assume these wires are ideal by the way, um, is going to be smaller than the EMF. Okay, So the terminal voltage can be expressed as such. Delta V is the EMF minus the current times the internal resistance of the battery, whatever this current happens to be. If a real battery is connected to a single external load resistor, it will provide terminal voltage over that resistor. Now by the way, this terminal, sorry, this uh, load resistor, that could actually be an entire resistor network. It could be many resistors in series and parallel. But for now, that's not the focus. Let's just model this as a single resistor, okay? So the current was going to be delta V over R. Remember, delta V is actually the terminal voltage of the battery. So now that we have an equation for the current and the terminal voltage, let's combine these things. So another way to express the current in terms of the internal and the load resistance is going to be current is equal to EMF divided by capital R plus little r. And little r, remember, is the resistance of the battery. Let's see where that comes from. Well, we can say that we can solve this equation for um, delta V, which it already is. So let's insert that in here. And then we want to solve algebraically for the current. So if we do that, I guarantee you'll get this equation. Okay. And then furthermore, the maximum current a battery can provide is the EMF divided by its internal resistance. That's because if it's not hooked up to a load resistor, then if it's only hooked up to ideal wires, uh, the, a battery can uh, produce a lot of current, namely um, the current of um, I max. All right, so let's see what happens if we do an example. So again, I will perform this in another video. Multiple batteries in series or in parallel. Consider two batteries in series. <clears throat> it's like one big battery, because notice that the overall voltages add, and then let's assume these are the EMFs, so that means the current is going to be EMF1 plus EMF2 divided by R1 plus R2 plus R load, and this is the load resistor, okay? Each of these batteries has an internal resistance. We've already kind of discussed that. Now, what if you connect two batteries in parallel? If they're the same battery, EMF, there's no change in voltage, but the internal resistance decreases, and thus more current can be provided. Let's think about why that is. Two batteries that are in parallel to each other have more paths for the current to move through these batteries. Now, by the way, if they have, let's say, different internal resistances, more current is going to flow through the battery that has lower internal resistance. Because as we discussed with parallel circuits, current tends to follow the path of least resistance. So, again, these two resistors that are in parallel to each other gives an internal resistance total that is smaller than either of these resistances. As a result, you can provide more current to the load. 
Okay, let's shift gears and let's talk about the last thing that's important for this lecture and another sort of separate topic regarding electric circuits and resistors, and that is grounding circuits. So let's talk about getting grounded. The earth itself is a conductor, or at least you could say the earth can provide or take on much charge. If we connect one point of a circuit to the earth, by an ideal wire, we can agree to call the potential of this point to be that of the Earth of zero volts. Okay? So that's sort of like the grounding or sort of the zero point of voltage. Remember, a zero point must be chosen for us to define this potential function, which we call voltage. The wire connecting the circuit to the Earth is now part of a complete circuit, so there is no, no current in this wire. Okay? So since the wire is connected to Earth itself, it's not a complete um, path for current to flow. A circuit connected to the Earth in this way is said to be grounded, and that wire is called the ground wire. The circular prong of a typical three-prong plug is a connection to the ground. So notice, this circular prong is the ground wire. Now the reason a ground wire is so important is because if you have an electronic device in your home and it somehow fails and it suddenly dumps off an extra lot of charge, this ground wire will protect the device from being damaged or from you being shocked. That is, the earth can receive a bunch of charge or give a bunch of charge to discharge the device, okay, if there's a short and if there's a problem. So let's have a look at a circuit that is grounded. This is almost like doing an example, but I'm just sort of walking through the example here as part of the lecture, as part of the notes. The figure shows a circuit with a 10 volt battery and two resistors in series. The symbol beneath the circuit on the lower left, in fact, is the ground symbol. I've introduced this symbol before in the circuit diagram symbols. The potential at ground is zero volts. Grounding the circuit allows us to have specific values for potential at each point in the circuit rather than just potential differences. So if we ground things at um, the piece of wire that's between the last load resistor and the negative terminal of the battery, that's the most typical place to ground a circuit. Because then this piece of wire is zero volts and then suddenly we go across the voltage source and we jump up to the terminal voltage of the battery Let's assume for now this is an ideal battery, so we jump right up to 10 volts here in the positive terminal, and then the conventional current flows, in this case, clockwise. Um, this conventional current is going to be half an ampere. Let's think why that is. Well, if we have an 8 and a 12 ohm resistor, and if these wires are ideal, then that's 20 ohms for the equivalent resistance. We're just adding those resistors in series. So then 10 volts divided by 20 ohms, I think, should be 0 0.5 amperes. So notice that this piece of wire on the top is rated at 10 volts. In other words, you can sort of say this wire is at a certain potential now. After we cross the 8-volt resistor with half an ampere, half an ampere times 8 ohms by Ohm's law, I times R is delta V. So delta V should be... 4 volts. So you go from 10 volts to now 6 volts. So this piece of wire in between the two resistors is now at 6 volts. And then we go from 6 volts to 8 volts. Why is that? Well, half an ampere times 12 ohms, that should be 6 volts. So it's a 6 volt drop. So we say we go now this piece of wire is at 0 volts. And that's because it's part of the grounded part of the circuit. Now, Suppose the circuit below were grounded at the junction between the two resistors instead of at the bottom. Find the potential at each corner of the circuit. Now it turns out if you ground, say at this junction point that's in between the two resistors, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, you can are free to set the zero point of voltage wherever you like. But it turns out that's a little bit less useful. Typically we want to define the zero point of voltage just before the power source, that is before the voltage source. So if you, this is the zero point, notice that we still need to have a potential difference of adding 12 volts. 
uh, or sorry, ten, I said that wrong, 10 volts over this ba uh, ideal battery. So if this is zero volts, notice that still with half an amp here, we have to go across this resistor. So we go from zero volts to negative six volts. That's because we still lose six volts as I did in the previous calculation. So this wire is now at six volts. We cross this 10 volt battery. And then now what we are at is we're at four volts. Okay. And notice that this wire is now at four volts. We still go four volts down from four volts to zero. And then now we're back to the ground place. Notice that we still sort of get the same results. It's just everything shifted. Now again, negative voltages are still correct as defined here. But again, most people, most electricians would not really like this. So we'd rather set the uh, zero point of voltage, the grounding point, the reference point, right before we hit the voltage source. I mean, that's most traditional, and I hope that makes sense. All right, so that ends uh, this lecture, which supplements uh, DC circuits, uh, electric circuits, um, series circuits, parallel circuits, etc. I want to thank you for your attention. Please smash that like button if you like this content and share it with people that you know. Please subscribe to this channel to support the channel and be on the lookout for new videos coming. I want to thank you very much for your attention and I will see you in the next video.